right? So then that leads us into, after we captured all of that data, the fun stuff, the analyzing, the really getting into what were what was I going to be finding from my participants. This was another intimidating part of this process for me because I had to first learn and understand the layers of phenomenology to do it justice. And uh, I actually think that my inner, my participant interviews taught me more about phenomenology than maybe even some of the texts leading up to researching about how to do phenomenology. That was something that I thought was really critical to my process. I learned so much about my methods through my method, if that makes sense. And so EPIC is something that we started doing very early on. I started doing very early on initially with obviously my um, my researcher's stance or my, or my subjectivity statement. But then I continued that bias uh, epic. I continued with my journaling. I journaled before interviews and between interviews, I would come home after driving and having all of these thoughts that I would dictate into my phone and I would you know, just continue to try to do that. Shifted kind of more into an analytical memoing. I shifted more of my bias into what was I learning about my interview participants. And I was able to also do uh, analytical memoing in kind of tandem with that FAK process. Um, first cycle coding was that phenomenological reduction, really reducing what my participants were saying into their experiences and actually capturing those significant statements or those significant uh, uh, experiences that I could then begin coding. I did, my first cycle coding was just a cold read through all of my transcripts, which was time consuming, but I think it was very important to just set aside any annotating and just absorb what my participants were saying, void of you know dialogue of a conversation and, and being in the moment. And then the last stage that we'll talk about, and that was the beauty of all of this, which was the emergence of my uh, my essences and what was I learning from what they were saying. To give you guys an example of maybe some of where I landed with my coding, my first cycle coding. You know, going into this, if you remember from my proposal, I was thinking that I could do some values coding, in vivo, descriptive, causation coding. Um, it was recommended to kind of do an eclectic version of it. So with the eclectic coding, I was able to use both in vivo and the descriptive code. And I feel like these two worked really, they, they formed a good relationship with what I was learning from, from my participants. And I feel like it was an appropriate research uh, analysis process. So as I would go through line by line, I would basically just pull out those in vivo codes. I would pull out those word for word, just significant statements that I thought had value or impact. And then the second time I read through, still part of first cycle coding, but I took all of those in vivo codes and I attached a descriptive code to those in vivo codes. And then that would obviously build up into certain categories and I would start to see patterns. And uh, just to give another example, now, uh, using kind of that in vivo coding, I would go attach then kind of just a descriptive code to that in vivo code, develop into those categories here. Categories then would start to build and they would um, develop into what we know as our team. And then this is where everything that I was learning in, you know, in, in coursework and reading started to come alive in, in my process. And I was able to see really what you're talking about there. You're a good person there. It won't work. <laughs> oh, LaShawn. There you go. No, she's good. I don't know how to use that. Oh, we got another one? Uh, that's the thing when they come in. Yeah. All right. So obviously, and then this is just one example of where I landed, and I'll talk about you know, one of my essences here, interpersonal relationships. Okay, I have to get back on my... There we go. So I still brought in the science person in me a little bit, because here is where my science brain came into. I had, I thought, you know, I'm going to do the note cards and I'm going to have physical note cards and my dining room is going to look like a mess and they're going to be everywhere. But that was very overwhelming to me and I could not handle that. So I went to what I know best and I, um, I began to just take all of my in vivo code and put them in one spreadsheet. And then I attached descriptive codes to those. And these are where, and then I started color coding them. And the beauty of that is once I had this massive spreadsheet, they were all color coded, then I could start moving things around and playing around with my data and seeing, okay, this is what is emerging there. This spreadsheet is actually, I forget how many columns wide it is. So this is just one example of just, you know, where I kind of landed on that. I was really also 
because I wanted when I did my dissertation writing, when I did my chapter four, I wanted to be able to draw out some of those longer narratives and really bring life to some of my participant responses. So I made sure that I reminded myself where, who said what and where I could go find that in the text to be able to discuss that uh, in my chapter four, because I thought that was really important. So this is just to give kind of a visual of where my headspace was with, with the coding process. And it really started to come together and breathe life into this. So these would be my descriptive codes that built into my categories that then built into themes and then you know, the multiple themes would group together for what I felt like the true essence of what my, my participants were saying to me. That um, imaginative um, variation process that's in Transcendental Phenomenology with Moustakis' work really focuses on the what was said and the interpretation of what, what was said as well. So this is that textual description, just kind of giving um, my participants, my readers as an example. There are tables and tables of rich text descriptions and structural descriptions. And being able to really do that nomadic process, and I always say it wrong, but the noesis process, noesis, I don't know, help me out, Dr. Mara, on that one. I don't always say it correctly. And then here's where we eventually landed. And this is what is the most important part of, I think, my entire process. And this is what I get most excited about, is what did we learn about why teachers are saying you know, reading back, back to that research question, which was just constantly guiding me. And anybody who's done either qualitative research or uh, phenomenological research knows that it's so easy to get distracted by your text, by what your participants are saying, because you wanna go down a rabbit hole, but if it's not, if it wasn't in line with the research question, I had, it was so difficult at times. And that was really where the analytical memoing came in and helped me. It helped me dismiss what I wanted to talk about and focus what I needed to talk about with my research question. Uh, so this is what came about primarily. What we learned about teachers is at first when I first began, because self-actualization is what I would say was the overarching, most significant theme. That one and the personal fulfillment and impact on others. And at first I thought, well, this isn't anything that we can do about. That's intrinsic. I can't do anything about making somebody feel purpose about what they do. But the more I got into what self-actualization and what my participants were really saying, I learned that there's actually quite a bit that we can learn from that. What structures can we put in place that, you know, my participants talked about, you know, navigating the difficult situations and learning to, for lack of a better term, don't sweat the small stuff. Don't get so bogged down about what you can't control um, whether it's parents, whether it's leadership, administration, legislation, um, assessments, all the things that kind of put pressure on teachers, I learned that my participants were able to navigate through that. Some of them navigated through that because of other essences that emerged, those interpersonal relationships, those supportive roles with leadership. All of my participants talked about negative experiences in these essences, but essentially it was the positive ones, a new building leader, moving into a different school setting, um, having a new partner to work with, that, that peer collaboration was significant, significant with them. So all of those uh, factors were influences that really achieved teachers wanting to stay. You know, teachers want to do this work. The biggest um, in, intrinsic motivator for most of them was that personal fulfillment. Many of my teachers talked about going beyond the curriculum. You know, doing something for students that was outside the bounds of English or math or social studies. It was going into a place that where you benefited and you thrived on that email you got two years later from that student in college that says, I am majoring in uh, literature because of the love that I developed from your class. All of my teachers would say that that didn't happen for them early on that they shared similar experiences to what the literature tells us about those first five, six, seven years of teaching. Teaching is hard. Teaching is difficult. And for us to be able to stay in it, they have components that came about in what you're seeing here. Um, school literature, or sorry, school administration and leadership is huge in literature, but it's on both sides. It's both why teachers leave, but it's also a huge influence for um, an impactful influence of why teachers stay. Uh, we learned that through the interpersonal relationship, sometimes my participants talked about that this was academic focused. It is that professional learning community model that we know is so important. 
but it was also just being able to brainstorm with teachers and collaborate and have that peer teacher that was experiencing what you were experiencing and you could be vulnerable with that person. And that person a lot of times became your friend outside of school as well. Having those strong bonds was something that was uh, seen in four or five of my participants pretty significantly. It was just having um, that mentor. Many of my teachers in the study, remember they were in the 10 to 20 year range, they wanna mentor other teachers. They wanna be that veteran teacher that helps newer teachers, but they wanna see value. They wanna feel value in it. So there's connectedness to that school leadership. There's connectedness to pay. One thing that I didn't talk a lot, a lot about in this presentation, but is significant in my dissertation, was I have 287 codes essentially that I landed on, which is a lot to manage, which is where that spreadsheet came in handy. But I had 87 codes that I kept in the background because it was also valuable to what I think that I was seeing in my research is that I did see the barriers. Teachers did talk about um, feeling devalued with compensation and pay, especially recently in Florida and what our teachers have been going through. That came up quite significantly, but it was having those growth mindset skills that came in self-actualization. It was developing the skills along the way that allowed you to just say, you know what, it's always gonna be like this. And I'm here because I have purpose. I'm here because I'm good at what I do. I feel confident in what I do. I'm efficacious when I come to work every day and I've seen the growth in that. And I have a team of people around me that support, that support me being that, whether it's my colleague or whether it's my leadership. So at first I thought, well, man, there's not a lot here that we can do anything about, but when you really start to process it and, and unlayer it, what can we do to be able to support teachers and make them get to that self-actualization, get to where they don't get bogged down in the stuff, the daily stuff that all of us don't love about a lot of the work that we do.